Okay, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what time you're watching this program. But this is Introduction to Technical Rescue for the Fire Officer. Now the idea of this program is for the, uh, the new fire officer who may have to respond to a technical rescue incident so that he or she knows um, how to identify a technical rescue incident, um, how to deal with it, what resources to call, um, things along those lines, and to set up an incident action plan. Now part of this classroom is going to require you to um, take a test at the end and there's also going to be a exercise um, that's going to require you to develop an incident action plan and then upload it uh, for grading. All right. <clears throat> Who's our audience? So you, uh, the new fire officer, okay, it's an introduction to technical rescue uh, and it's structured towards the new company officer uh, who may be a first responder to an incident that's not a routine incident. All right. So this class is an awareness type class uh, to give the company officer an initial deployment model to get control of a technical rescue incident. So we're going to discuss in this uh, this class um, what is a technical rescue incident? What apparatus um, do you need? What type of apparatus is going to be responding? Uh, we'll talk about levels of PPE, um, tools that you might need. Uh, we're going to discuss briefly NFPA 1670 and 1006, which are resource documents uh, for technical rescue. Uh, we'll talk about developing an incident. So under NFPA, you know, your role in a technical rescue incident is going to be an awareness level. So um, the very top, it's, it's bold and it's underlined. So recognize the need uh, for technical rescue resources at an incident. And if you read through this, uh, it's basically saying that you need to be able to identify a technical rescue incident. Um, you need to be able to identify the resources that are going to be needed to respond to a technical rescue incident. Uh, you need to create safe zones, um, start an incident command system, uh, set up control, some control points and perimeters, and keep pr people that are not required or trained to be involved in a situation to enter into those, those areas. Uh, it's just like in HAZMAT where we create um, a hot zone, cold zone, warm zone. So think of it as a HAZMAT incident. You're creating those zones uh, at this technical rescue. <clears throat> so what is a technical rescue? Technical rescue is a rescue where the application of special knowledge, skills, and equipment to safely resolve unique and or complex rescue situations. Uh, technical rescue incident is a complex rescue incident requiring specially trained personnel and special equipment to complete the mission. All right, um, Right here in yellow uh, A to F um, for personnel on my technical rescue team uh, and if I didn't introduce myself in the beginning I'm sorry uh, my name is John Novak um, I currently am in charge of the the Toms River Technical Rescue Task Force and also the Ocean County Regional Urban Strike Team um, in Toms River uh, that said um, a lot of people on our team um, have have training to the level that you see in yellow. I think this is kind of a, a baseline level of training that one would expect from a person um, on a technical rescue team. So it's almost like a minimum level of training that um, I would like to see all personnel have that are going to be on my team. And that includes uh, rope rescue, operations level, uh, that's about 40 hours. Rope rescue technician level is about 40 hours. Uh, structural collapse uh, one, structural collapse two, you're looking at probably 80 to 100 hours. Um, you can find space operations class, which is about 16 hours, and trench rescue, it's about 16 hours. <clears throat> so that's about 212 hours minimum, um, just to be fairly competent 
in dealing with a, a, a good majority of tactical rescue incidents. Um, and again, I don't include the swift water. We do have a lot of guys that have the swift water and water rescue training. Um, tower rescue, that's, that's a different animal unto itself that requires specialized training and equipment. And wide area search, uh, confined space and trench technician level classes. So that's a, that's a, a good start for someone that uh, is going to be on a technical rescue team or someone that um, you want to look for uh, to deal with technical So we have some uh, guidance documents and the first one is NFPA 1006 standard for technical rescue personnel professional qualifications. So you're probably going to see this again in a test. Uh, if I didn't mention uh, at the end of the, this lecture there is a, a, a quiz that you need to pass. Um, so anyway, this document here basically sets the stage. It, it lays out the training requirements for the individual for every component of uh, tactical rescue, every competency. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we talk about uh, tactical rescue, all the competencies in tactical rescue they're laid out the same way. You have an awareness level, you have an operations level, and you have a technician level. And there's 19 competencies in technical rescue. So again, you may see this, you may see this again as a question. So here are those 19 competencies. Uh, tower rescue, rope rescue, structural collapse, confined space, vehicle rescue, which we all know as extrication. Uh, animal technical rescue, wilderness search and rescue, trench rescue, machinery rescue, that includes elevators, which I'm going to talk about elevators uh, at the end, uh, cave rescue, mine and tunnel rescue, helicopter rescue, surface water rescue, swift water, dive rescue, ice rescue, surface rescue, watercraft rescue, and flood water rescue. So those are all the tactical rescue competencies in NFPA 1006. Now you're also going to see uh, NFPA 1670. Um, 1670 deals with requirements for teams. Okay, 1006 is the individual pers person, their requirements. Uh, 1670 is the requirements for teams. All right, so just understand the difference between. Them. So we talk about the core competencies. So here's just. Uh, I listed a few of the core competencies that we see a lot of. So we're going to talk about um, water rescue, so flood water, swift water, ice water. All right. So one of the big things here is proper PPE. I'll mention PPE again, but these uh, gentlemen are dressed in dry suits with personal protective equipment, um, uh, PFDs. All right, for flotation, they got helmets. So they they are dressed in the proper equipment for anyone entering water to do some type of rescue. My big pet peeve is, one of my pet peeves, I have many of them, my big pet peeve is don't allow firefighters to walk around in flood water in bunker gear. Uh, you get flood waters, especially if the streets are flooded. Uh, if the streets are flooded, normally the manholes, catch basins and all that, they're flooded. Um, if you lose a manhole cover and you got a firefighter walking down the street and all of a sudden steps into an open manhole, uh, you're probably never going to see him again. All right. Uh, if he has the proper PPE with the PFD and other techniques that we train in, uh, if he should step in a manhole, which he shouldn't step in because he's going to be uh, um, checking in front of him as he goes with a stick. Um, if he does happen to trip, fall, or whatever, uh, he's going to have the, the proper PPE that's going to keep him afloat, uh, hopefully from going all the way into the manhole. So <clears throat> don't let your people wear bunker gear walking around them. Apparatus for technical rescue. All right, so most often there's going to be some type of heavy rescue responding. All right, I know we would respond with the heavy rescue. Um, you may get a technical rescue incident and your first response is going to be a heavy rescue. <clears throat> and again, companies may respond with a heavy rescue vehicle, but are the personnel on that vehicle trained and equipped to handle that emergency? Um, 
again, you need to know your fire department. Can your fire department, can your members handle certain technical rescue emergencies with your rescue company? You need to make that determination. You know, if, if the guys have the guys show up um, with no training, um, no equipment, all they have is a nice truck. So, again, you need to know your department. But again, for technical rescue, you're probably going to see some type of heavy rescue vehicle responding on the incident. Trailers, uh, trailers are a big thing in technical rescue, especially for us. Um, they're carrying um, all kinds of extra equipment that normally uh, can't be carried on uh, a rescue truck. Um, in this case, we're talking lumber, uh, 4x4s, uh, sheets of plywood, trench panels, uh, nails, hammers, um, Paratex struts, uh, jackhammers, all kinds of stuff. So, uh, in the picture here, the, the center picture is our trailer set up. We're working at a, a, a motel fire. We had the shore to place up. Over to the right, there was a um, parking garage incident earlier, um, a number of years ago. You can see the trailers um, set up. You, you can see what's carried in the trailers. Bottom right is our collapsed trailer, which carries a, a you know a, a bunch of equipment uh, for structural collapse. So you're going to see a lot of trailers showing up at a technical rescue incident. A biggie is a ladder company. Um, rope rescue incidents. Um, we love um, ladder trucks because they give us a high point anchor. So anytime you can get a high point anchor in rope rescue, that's a home run. So uh, aerial ladders, tower ladders, a uh, great resource for us to use um, in tactical rescue. So something that, again, as the IC, you get a rope rescue incident. Um, any any incident that might include a rope. Um, have some a ladder truck on the response even if it's not used it's there if we need it we can put it into operation vac trucks again you get into trench rescue uh, vac trucks are, are a great tool um, not only for sucking out dirt um, for dewatering if you get um, water infiltration groundwater infiltration in the trench a uh, great tool to get the the water out as you're working so tactical rescue is is really equipment driven along with training so over here you can see we have a, a tripod set up for a confined space training uh, we're using uh, shoring raker shoring paratech raker shores uh, for uh, structural collapse training we have search cameras uh, this search camera goes for about fifteen thousand dollars. Again, a nice toy to play with. And again, you can see the um, the members and their PPE. <coughs> now, again, it, um, most often we're not going to be wearing structural firefighting gear, um, depending on the incident. So our PPE may be a, you know, a BDU uniform, uh, maybe a light a lighter weight type of uh, turnout gear. So um, just be aware of that. Uh, our guys show up this is their personal protective equipment so you as the uh, new incident commander just so you're aware of that other uh, tools uh, jackhammers we're going to be breaching in this case we're breaching a wall in training so uh, jackhammers uh, torches in this instance here we're using a, a petrogen torch um, we also use oxyacetylene torches exothermic cutters plasma cutters so there's a uh, you know number of torches that can get involved again it's equipment driven uh, and, and training driven for technical rescue one of our bread and butter um, incidents shoring up a structure in this case um, we went in put up paratex struts to make a safe area and then we built around the, the paratex with wood uh, we created a three post vertical shore uh, to hold up the first floor of this building where the foundation was washed away uh, due to uh, severe uh, downpour in the person's yard uh, it just wiped out the um, the block in the basement ground up rescue tactical rescue for a PPE um, again rope rescue is 
heavily is heavy in equipment and training so we get an incident um, on a tower uh, our personnel here are doing training on the tower uh, specialized equipment specialized training um, if you look here where the red arrow is there is a full arrest cable that's actually built into the tower uh, we have a, a full arrest adapter that goes onto the cable that we secure the uh, our rescuer to his harness <coughs> the the lead climber will, will climb up with a safety line he'll tie the safety line off to the tower and then the rest of our personnel can attach to the safety line and climb up and again here's an instance where you don't want any of your personnel climbing unless they're they're trained and equipped and have a plan uh, this is a this is the old Sibagagi water tower. It's no longer there. Uh, this is looking down. I'm at the catwalk. It's about 150 feet down. Um, the red rope to the left is the safety line that was brought up by the lead climber. Uh, he came up with uh, a set of hooks on a lanyard. So he was constantly attached to the structure as he, cl as he climbed up. Um, you get a case like this. You get somebody up on a tower. Uh, first impulse possibly for for some of the first responders is you know let's climb up well if you're not trained and you don't have the equipment stay off the tower because now you become a liability you become another victim for us that we once we get up there now we have to secure you now we have to deal with the first patient first victim and then we have to figure out a way to get you down once you climbed up there all right to be safe so specialized equipment for uh, water rescue, high water vehicles, and you can see the guys in the high water vehicle, they have the proper PPE on. Uh, guys doing some uh, swift water training, dry suits with PFDs on. And most of all, you know, you got to have the training to do the job. So, um, one of your, your your big issues with being the initial officer responding to a tactical rescue is do you have the proper people responding uh, that can take care of the situation machine rescue this includes elevators again I'll get more into uh, elevator rescue later but I just like this this picture and you know it doesn't get any better than firefighters rescuing cops at their own police station so again um, but again remember those guys they got a ticket book they'll they'll track you down later and uh, they'll get they'll get payback so don't rub it in too much so we talk core competencies so again confined space rescue uh, one of our core competencies that we possibly could see a lot of that that can get us in trouble all right so confined space um, what is space? And when we talk about confined spaces, uh, confined space is regulated under OSHA. <clears throat> In this case, we have CFR 1910-146, Permit Entry Confined Space for General Industry Standard. So CFR, that means Code of Fe Federal Regulation. So this is a law. You need to abide by this law. All right, you'll probably see this again on a test. Um, even though we're the fire department, we fall under OSHA and we need to do things right so this this confined space this confined space standard uh, is not only for general industry we're also also bound by it if we respond to a confined space emergency uh, lockout tag out um, another biggie anytime we're working in confined space anytime we're working around equipment we need to follow lockout tag out again this is OSHA requirement uh, if we don't follow these OSHA requirements um, we could get jammed up with fines not to mention we could injure or hurt one of our own people injure or hurt um, um, the public so we need to be cognizant and understand these, uh, these OSHA regulations CFR 1910.268 work in telecommunication electrical vaults now the top one 1910.146 uh, uh, confined space uh, that's for general industry now the guys that work in telecommunications vaults you know underground manholes that uh, do some type of you know communication work things like that 
they have their own standard. So some of the things may be slightly different from the 1910 standard. So um, just be, be aware of that. But we're going to be held to that 1910 standard for emergency response as a fire department. 1926.652 uh, protection of workers and excavations um, this mainly trench work so uh, guys working in trenches there is a OSHA standard for that they have to be protected uh, trenches have to be dug and protected in certain ways uh, by OSHA we talk about confined space 60 percent of all confined space fatalities are would-be rescuers so who is the would-be rescuer? Uh, that's the the guy that's working with the guy that, that is in the confined space and all of a sudden he doesn't answer. Hey, what happened? He looks down there, the guy's down there, he climbs down, he becomes a he com becomes a victim. All right. Uh, police officer shows up, he climbs down, he becomes a victim. EMS fire department shows up, they climb down, they become a victim, all right? Um, all would be rescuers. You know, there's a reason that that person is unresponsive in the space. So we need to find out, you know, what's going on. Okay, so it sounded like there was an interruption or was. I had to walk away for a minute. Um, but 60% of all confined space fatalities are would-be rescuers. Um, like I was saying, there's there's a reason why person is at the bottom of the hole unresponsive um, we need to find out is it a bad atmosphere most times you can find space it's because of a bad atmosphere uh, but did the person slip and fall off the ladder um, was he electrocuted uh, did he have a heart attack uh, we don't know so we need to you know monitor the space we need to get you know atmospheric readings um, find out what the atmosphere is like before we just start you know climbing down so first of all we need to know what is a confined space so confined space definition is an employee can make bodily entry to perform work it has a limited means of entry and egress meaning that there's one way in one way out and it's not designed for con continuous human occupancy it's a space where you want to go in do your work and then get out it also has one of more of the following characteristics it contains a known or potential hazard and has a configuration that could trap a worker, right? So this is a criteria for: is it a, a permit required confined space? Uh, so if if it has these two elements, it requires a permit, an entry permit. Now, if we can mitigate these these two issues, um, the permit doesn't need to be issued. But again, um, this is the definition and some of the hazards of trench rescue. Right. Um, when we deal with trench rescue, we're looking at um, the need to protect the trench. So we talk about a protected trench. Um, there needs to be some type of shoring put in place to prevent a secondary collapse. Um, you can see, first of all, you can see to the right uh, these gentlemen are standing on plywood, so they're they're on ground pads. So that's distributing the weight. Right. So tries to eliminate a secondary collapse of the trench wall. Uh, we can see that our, our firefighter is inside the trench but he's in a safe area because we created that safe area using trench panels and using uh, paratech struts. So now he can now he can start uh, digging for the, the person. High angle rope rescue again here's our water tower um, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the only time somebody went on a water tower was to, to paint it every so many years. Um, you know, now anytime there's, there's water towers and, and other high structures, um, we see a lot of cell phone antennas. So there's a chance of, you know, workers uh, climbing up onto these structures. Uh, there's a higher probability that, you know, at some point there could be a, a, an injury, an accident. Um, medical emergency that we may be responding to uh, to get somebody down off of one of these structures. Structural collapse. Um, in our area, um, most of our structural collapse uh, deals with you know a vehicle crashing into a building, um, 
maybe a fire, you know, shoring up a building after a fire for investigation. Um, not a whole lot um, as far as some of the urban areas where um, they get more structural collapses just from the age of the buildings and the buildings falling down or, or construction going on next door to a building and the building collapses. Um, but we, we still deal with structural collapse from time to time and there still has to be people that are trained on how to deal with it. So let's transition into command and control at technical rescue incidents. So Larry Collins, who's a uh, big guy, big technical rescue guy from LA. Okay, sorry, another interruption. All right, so Larry Collins, um, big technical rescue guy from LA, uh, wrote a book on technical rescue. And he says, effective command of rescue operations does not require one to be an expert in technical rescue. However, it helps to have good working knowledge of what needs to be done, who needs to do it, and how to support them. So this, this is right there along the lines of what we talked about as the, to the awareness level. And that's what you as a new officer responding to a technical rescue incident um, needs to be able to achieve. So let's go back to our firefighter level two. Now in firefighter level two, there was a section called assisting special teams. Now in assisting special teams, there was an acronym called failure. Now you're going to see this again probably on a test, all right? But why do rescuers fail? And this doesn't necessarily have to be tactical rescue team rescuers. It could be uh, guys in your firehouse that respond to different types of calls, maybe guys that are on an extrication team, um, uh, they do firefighting or, or do something else, but there's a, a reason why they fail. So if you can identify this, then you can take corrective action um, to remediate it. So F, failure. Failure to understand the environment or underestimating it. All right. Additional medical problems not considered. Inadequate rescue skills. So the the members aren't trained on skills. All right. So if they if they haven't gone out and done skills such as they haven't done gotten their hands on rope and done rope work, they haven't worked with uh, shoring equipment things like that. Um, chances are they're not going to be very sharp uh, when the time comes to put those skills to work. Right. Uh, lack of teamwork or experience. All right big thing and especially goes back to your firehouse I know I just heard recently uh, a, a retired retired firefighter from New York said the the most dangerous firefighter in uh, the city is the guy that has five years experience who's been, or who's been on the job for five years because he thinks he knows it all um, again the it's the the lack of you, you know you don't know what you don't know can come back to uh, to hurt you. Get understanding the logistics of the incident. Okay, so you as the uh, first arriving incident commander, not not understanding the breadth of what needs to be done at this type of incident. All right, and then again, rescue versus recovery. All right, um, we're constantly operating in the rescue mode, but you know, do we need to back up and say, listen, slow down? Um, is this actually an actual rescue? Is it an actual recovery? Um, we look at Gordon Graham um, talks about the uh, low frequency uh, high risk events. So low frequency doesn't happen a lot. Uh, high risk, there's, there's a serious consequence to us being injured. Um, we need to slow down, come up with a plan, take our time. And equipment not mastered. Again, this doesn't necessarily have to be uh, tactical rescue equipment. This could be equipment that you carry on your, your fire apparatus. You know, do you go out and train uh, with this equipment on a regular basis or does it just sit in the, the, the cabinet collecting dust and uh, when you need it you pull it out and it doesn't start, it doesn't work, no one knows how to use it, things like that. So again you need to have an aggressive training program. So incident assessment according to John Norman we have to take an assessment of the the incident that we're responding to. 
So one of the first things is we have to ask what happened, right? If you don't know what happened, how are you going to plan for the incident? Uh, we need to know the number of victims. How many how many victims are there, or how many are affected or trapped? Um, if we go there and there's no victims, do we really need to do anything? Right? If there's a if there's a, a building collapse and we can account for any victims. Do we need to start putting up shoring if there's there's no hazard? Where we just you know have the owner secure the area, uh, hire a contractor or engineer to, to make the repairs. If there are victims, are they savable? Again, going back to that rescue versus recovery scenario, we need to make that uh, evaluation. <clears throat> Can the incident be handled by the resources on hand or en route? What are the dangers to the responders? Can these dangers be mitigated? Incident action plan. So, you, know, you as the incident commander, you need to come up with an incident action plan. So, I always say define the problem. Again, it's almost like what happened. So, what's the problem? Once you know the problem, you can develop a strategy and set goals, and then develop objectives. When we talk about objectives, we can use the acronym SMART. So the objective is needs to be specific. It needs to be measurable. All right. It needs to be action oriented. It needs to be realistic, and there needs to be some type of time element involved. And this SMART objective comes right out of uh, ICS 300. Okay. Once you develop an objective, you need to find somebody to give that objective to. So you need to locate a resource and then assign the objective. Now, don't overburden your resources with giving them more than one objective at a time. Another thing is you need to reduce your span of control as the incident commander. Assign divisions, sectors, or groups as needed, but reduce your span of control, and try to uh, fill these these sectors with some aggressive, smart um, personnel that um, have strong leadership abilities to get the job done, and then develop an incident command structure and an organizational structure for. The so we talk about technical rescue resources. Um, the parent organization, and again, you may see this again on a test, uh, in New Jersey is New Jersey Task Force One. All right, um, They were a state team. Um, they've now become a FEMA, federal FEMA team. But they're the ones that um, pretty much have developed the training curriculum for technical rescue in the state of New Jersey. Now, after 9-11, Homeland Security developed the Urban Area Security Initiative, UASI, and this was to deal with the uh, sensitive infrastructure, mainly bridges, tunnels, ports, things like that, and a lot of this was in the urban area, so urban areas of North Jersey and also in uh, South Jersey and along the waterfront by you know Philadelphia, that area. But the UASI uh, strike teams or metro strike teams were developed um, as, a, as a tier below New Jersey Task Force 1 so you would have um, trained technical rescue people responding to these areas um, to mitigate technical rescue emergencies so in the UASI area they have the metro strike teams which uh, are comprised of Hackensack, Jersey City, North, North Hudson, Elizabeth, Hoboken, Patterson, Bayonne, and Moorestown. Now they're six-person companies um, they may all respond as one they m may respond you know two or three at a time depending on the size of the incident now they they may get to an incident handle the incident um, or they may call uh, for resources from the parent organization New Jersey Task Force one to respond um, to, to augment their operation to take over their operation depending on the size of it, the complexity, 
the equipment that's needed, things like that. So that's Metro Strike teams. Now, the rest of New Jersey, there was a void. There was the Uasi area, but then there was nothing else. So the rest of the counties, um, there was a project put together to develop a regional urban strike team for every county. So this was called Rust Team. All right. So Rust teams resembled the Metro strike teams, except um, they were on a county level. So in Ocean County, where, where we are, we have the Ocean County Rust Regional Urban Strike Team. So the Regional Urban Strike Team uh, is put together from teams that were already in existence. So uh, Tom's River, Brick, and Pinewald already had technical rescue teams in place. So uh, we came together under the umbrella of the Ocean County Rust Team under the, uh, the County Fire Coordinator. So for Ocean County, we have uh, the Rust Team comprised of those three companies. And those are technical rescue resources that can be utilized by the incident commander at a technical So as the incident commander, you need to develop an organizational structure. So command, right, you're going to be command. And the home company always remains as command. You know, you don't, you don't, you're always going to be in charge of that incident. You can also have an operations sector, right? And your home company usually maintains the operations sector because under operations, you may have the technical rescue that needs to be taken care of, but you may also need suppression personnel, EMS personnel, um, you know, other things going on. So the, the rescue team is going to respond and take over the rescue incident but they're going to report to the operations. Now the operations guy may know very little about technical rescue, but um, it's still your your area, your town. Um, you're in charge. We don't take charge. The technical rescue teams don't take charge. They just work under the operations sector to um, complete the task that's needed, complete the mission. <clears throat> and again, the technical rescue team operates as a sector or division under your command. So we talk about structural collapse. So there's stages of a structural collapse. There's way things have to be approached depending on the severity of the collapse. Um, and these stages, again, you may see these again in a test. Um, so scene survey and recon. That can be done by first due companies. Take a look at the scene, what's going on, do a recon, all right, get the lay of the land. Uh, surface victim removal. So the first in companies, you know, you have people on, on the top of the pile, lightly lightly entrapped in the pile. You know, they're going to be removed by the first, you know, responding uh, police, EMS, or firefighters. But now there may be a reason to surge voids. So now we start getting into a technical component here. So we need people that have some type of training, uh, experience, and equipment. So when we start with the search of the voids, <clears throat> we may start to remove some debris and start tunneling. So now this is going to require structural uh, shoring. Uh, so we're going to put shores in place as we tunnel, things like that. And the, the last uh, stage of operations is general debris removal. So this is where we come in with a uh, heavy equipment, a crane. <clears throat> we may have to lift um, you know, parts of the structure to get to other parts of the structure and then go back to the debris removal and tunneling. Um, so those are the five main stages of a structural collapse response. Uh, confined space, again, confined space incidents. Um, if they're below grade, there is a rope rescue component involved, which again is heavily, you know, equipment driven, training driven. Um, now we also get into areas where there may be atmospheric issues. So we may be involving uh, uh, supplied air breathing apparatus, hard wire communications. <clears throat> so there's a lot of stuff going on at confined space incident. So as the initial responder uh, to a confined space incident, um, you need to ask yourself, are rescue personnel trained in confined space emergencies responding? If not, call for a technical response box for, for a confined space. Um, set up a visual, a visible incident command. 
Uh, scene security is very important. Uh, remove non-essential persons, develop an instant action plan. And again, at these incidents, you're probably going to have uh, either co-workers that are trying to make a rescue, um, other, other emergency workers uh, responding, trying to get, uh, get involved in a rescue because they think they have to. They don't realize the severity of the issue. They don't realize the, the hazards. Um, so you have to maintain a strong command presence and may have to physically get law enforcement to remove some of these people. And again, some of your problems may be law enforcement themselves if they get involved in it. So um, it, it's a, a very difficult situation uh, when you get So your initial assessment, okay, what kind of space is it, right? Are there immediate hazards? Is it an atmospheric hazard? Is it a flooding hazard? Is it an electrical hazard? Um, if it's a construction site or a job site, is there somebody in charge? Can someone give you information on a site? Uh, or a witness. Uh, how many victims are there? What's their lo what was their location? Uh, again, the determine the mechanism of injury. You know, uh, why is the person laying on the bottom of the hole? Did he uh, have a heart attack? Did he fall off the ladder? Did he get electrocuted? Or is there bad air? And again, is it a rescue or recovery? You know, some hard decision. So again, establish a secure perimeter and entry point, just like hazmat. Cold zone, warm zone, hot zone. Deny entry. If if that if those people aren't supposed to be entering the space, um, if they're not part of the the mission, you gotta maintain uh, strict entry criteria. All right, positive pressure ventilation. Again, it's a confined space. There's more than likely bad atmosphere. Um, we need to get air into the space so we can start uh, positive pressure ventilation with a fan. Um, air monitoring big issue. All right. Everyone carries a, a monitor now uh, for CO readings, for CO emergencies. Um, most of them are for gas. They'll do uh, oxygen. <clears throat> so if you don't have a tube, a sampling tube to put on your meter, uh, find a piece of string or rope or something, tie it to the meter, drop the meter down into the space, uh, try to get a reading, and you'll see what the, uh, the, the atmosphere is in the space. If you're along a street or there's other openings, pop some manholes, get some cross ventilation going into the space. The more air we can get, more fresh air we can get into the space, the better off it's going to be for the victim. And again, if you are not trained and you don't have the right equipment, stay out and keep everybody. Uh, rope rescue, high angle rescue, uh, definition of a high angle, uh, anything with a degree over 40 degrees. Um, we normally think of buildings, we think of towers. Um, if you get into urban areas where there's tall buildings and they use scaffolds for uh, window washers, uh, we're talking scaffolds. Okay, low angle, less than 40 degrees, maybe a slope rescue uh, along a parkway or something like that, or, or down an embankment where uh, it, the footing may be because of rain or snow or whatever, ice. Um, we may have to put a patient into a Stokes basket and use some rope to assist uh, pulling that person up the embankment to get up to uh, to the ambulance. So that would be a slope slope rescue. Another big thing is um, taller buildings. Say the the elevators are not working. There's a power outage. You got a, a large a large patient that has to be brought down a stairwell. Um, it, it may be a rope may need a rope operation to facilitate. An easier and quicker removal down a stairwell um, than trying to uh, have one person at one end of the Stokes, the other person at the other end of the Stokes, trying to um, move this person down a stairwell and, and make a turn at the end at the stairs. And um, rope system is much much easier and, and faster operation to uh, to do that. We talk about ground up. So ground up means we're going to start on the ground. We're going to climb up. So like a tower, a water tower. We're going to have some type of a lead climb person. They're going to uh, have some type of fall arrest as they climb up. Uh, most often trail a safety line and attach a safety line uh, so the rest of the rescuers can tie into the safety line and climb up safely. Or it could be a top-down rescue, so we may access the, the patient from uh, the, the same level. So 
we'll say a machine room, mechanical room that's up on top of the building, maybe even a roof. We can climb up a stairwell. Um, you know, no fall arrest required, and we can just we may have to transition that person, you know, from a roof or from a mechanical room uh, down to grade. So again, here's a just some pictures. Uh, where rope rescue, high angle rescue, it's equipment driven and high degree of training that's required. Trench emergencies. So when we talk about trench emergencies, um, trench re trenches require protection. And what protection means is we need to prevent a secondary collapse or having the, the, the lip or the side of the trench collapse in. So any trench deeper than five feet, including the height of the spoil pile. So the spoil pile is the pile of dirt along the trench. Uh, anything higher than five, anything below five feet requires protection. So we ha there has to be some type of shoring in place, a trench box. Um, when they dug the trench, the, the the excavator or the backhoe needed to bench or slope the trench walls away, so they can't collapse into the trench. Um, but it needs to be protected. So. That's what we mean by protect. Some uh, trench facts. Um, soil weighs approximately 100 pounds per cubic foot. A victim trapped under one foot of soil would not be able to expand his or her lungs. And collapsing soil from a trench wall moves at like 40, 40 miles per hour. So you're not going to outrun it. So some things that you can do as initial responder to a trench rescue. Um, call for a technical response team. Uh, remove anyone from the unprotected trench. So the, um, again, unprotected trench means there's there's no shoring, there's no sheeting, there's no trench box. Uh, it's not sloped or benched, so there's a possibility of the trench wall. There would be a secondary collapse of a trench wall onto rescuers that are, have climbed into the trench. Shut down any mechanical equipment. Okay, vibration is not our friend. Um, there also tends to be issues with um, if there is a trench collapse, um, the person on the, say, the backhoe or the excavator may want to try to dig that person out using mechanical equipment. Um, that usually never goes well for the victim um, because when you get trapped in a trench collapse, it's almost like an avalanche. Uh, you may start at one location in the trench, and by the time the dirt comes down and hits you, you're actually at another location in the trench and they can't see you because you're covered with dirt. So um, when the, the person on the excavator starts attempts to dig dig the dirt from around you, they may actually uh, hit you with the, the bucket. Um, and if you're not already dead, you definitely will be by the time they're done. So again, you need to shut down any mechanical equipment if you get there and you see personnel attempting to use mechanical equipment, uh, you need to secure that equipment. You may ne even need to get law enforcement involved uh, to take the keys away from that person and, and maybe um, just restrain them or take them, move them from the scene. Uh, clear the area around the trench of any non-rescue personnel. Again, this is where you need the perimeter and an entry point. And Locate location of victims last known. Uh, that doesn't read right, but what we're trying to say here is uh, if you can get an idea of where the victim was, it may give you a, a area to uh, First in companies at a trench incident. So what can you do? All right. Here we got firefighters taking shovels and they're removing the spoil pile. So if this is a construction site and you got those uh, workers there and they need something to do, you can you can um, possibly redirect their energy towards, hey guys, start moving the dirt away from the lip of the trench. And once you move the dirt away from the lip of the trench, if there's wood available, start laying wood down along the lip of the trench so that you can stand on it. So now you're dispersing your weight, hopefully, um, so you don't cause a secondary collapse of the trench wall. And then once we get the the spoil pile moves, we get um, ground pads in place, then we go ahead and we start putting in uh, our trench panels uh, held up with uh, 
Paratec struts. Uh, there's a trench panel. Paratec strut. We create a safe work area. Now the, the rescuer can start digging for the victim. Again, this becomes a, a perfect location to start utilizing the vac truck. All right, either to suck dirt out or if there's groundwater infiltration to uh, get water out of the trench. And here's a just a schematic of a, a trench operation. It almost looks like a hazmat incident. Again, we set up a, a cold zone, a warm zone, and a hot zone. Again, only people that need to be standing around that trench are people that absolutely need to be there at that time. All right. Because again, if we're standing on the edge of the trench, the more weight we put on the edge of the trench, the more chance there is to cause a secondary collapse. Here's my pet peeve, elevator emergencies. Uh, this may not be a technical response for a lot of companies because we respond to elevator emergencies all the time. Um, but there's things that need to happen. And many times I don't see these things happening. Um, and it, 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 it's kind of dangerous. So in the picture to the left here, um, apparently the kid was elevator surfing and he got stuck between floors and was crushed. But <clears throat> again, you try to move a person um, off an elevator and the elevator isn't secured, the power isn't secured. You don't know the mechanical problems with that elevator. Uh, I'm not taking that chance, all right? that the elevator moves while moving people between floors or out of the elevator car. So there's a procedure that needs to be taken. So one of the first things you need to do is when you get there is locate the car in the hoistway. Um, there, there may already be people on scene that can tell you where the car is. Um, unfortunately there may also be people on scene that are trying to open the car door. So a lot of this happens a lot in buildings that have uh, building maintenance personnel. Um, they all they just grab elevator keys and they go and they start trying to you know open the car door. Um, not not a good thing. All right. What we need to do is communicate with the occupants in the car. And once we locate them, you need to tell them, hey, listen, fire department's here. We'll have you out in a few minutes. Uh, assess any medical issues. All right. Again, the safest place for those people to be is inside the car, believe it or not. Uh, elevators are the most common form of uh, transportation in the United States, public transportation. Uh, it's Unless the building's on fire and there's smoke in the shaft, um, they're, they're perfectly safe in the elevator car until we get the elevator car safely opened up. Unless, of course, they have a, a medical emergency, then we need to move a little bit faster. But while this is going on, um, you should be sending a team of radio equipped firefighters with forceful entry tools to locate the elevator machine room. Now there may be a key to the elevator machine room but if there's no key um, they may have to force the door. Now the main issue is when they get there they need to identify the elevator and they need to secure the power. Uh, always 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 kill the power to the elevator before op opening the hoistway door. This, this does two things. Um, it prevents the elevator from moving and it also takes the torque off the elevator car door motor so it's a lot easier to open up the elevator hoistway door and the elevator car door. So that said, if, if, we, open up the, if we open up the elevator hoistway door and we can see the location of the elevator and it's a hydraulic elevator, uh, we can have the the crew that's in the uh, elevator machine room lower a hydraulic elevator down to the landing and then the people can just walk out the car with no problem. Uh, if it's a cable elevator we're not going to do anything with a cable elevator other than kill the power. Even a elevator technician in most instances will not attempt to lower a cable elevator with people in the car. Just too dangerous. Um, so if we have a cable elevator, we locate it, we locate the location, we kill the power. Uh, I like to use the term up and out. So if we can get the, the ladder into the elevator car and extract the people, then climb up the, the ladder and out onto the floor, uh, much safer than a down and out. 
down and out instances like you see in the, the picture on the top where the people would have to climb down and now you have that open elevator shaft so we would need to barricade that el open elevator shaft a to keep any any people from falling in or keeping from our people to fall into the elevator shaft so but getting back to the elevator always 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 kill the power to the elevator before opening the hoistway door that's definitely one of my pet peeves so coming to the end of this uh, if you can't remember anything else remember these response and deployment points identify a technical rescue incident all right so you need to know what is what a technical rescue incident is so you can call for the correct resources and if you do um, identify it as a technical rescue are the correct resources responding uh, you need to implement an incident command system immediately and appoint a strong sector division or group officers to reduce your span of control uh, in most cases you're going to have to secure establish a secure perimeter an entry point um, again fire police or is a great resource for this um, establish an entry point set up a hot zone develop an incident action plan and biggest thing out of this in any incident get control of the situation get control of yourself first then get control of the situation and then move on so I didn't coin the phrase but I like to use it train until you can't get it wrong so there's my info um, give me a call um, I've been putting stuff up on a YouTube channel so there's stuff up there if you want to look at that so um, thanks for watching again remember there is a uh, a quiz in this program you have to pass the quiz with 70 percent or better and there's also a scenario exercise that's going to require you to do a essay type answer developing a instant action plan for the the video that you're required to watch all right so again thanks for watching and again train until you can't get it wrong